In this presentation, we will discuss common statistical tests used for analyzing two-way frequency tables. Three of the most commonly encountered tests are the chi-square test of homogeneity, Fisher's exact test, and McNamara's test for paired data. Although most of the examples we will use in this module focus on the simplest two-way frequency table containing two rows and two columns, commonly known as two-by-two -two tables, two-way frequency tables can contain more than two rows and two columns, commonly referred to as R by C tables, R representing rows and C representing columns. Both the chi-square test of homogeneity and the Fisher's exact test are applicable for both 2 by 2 and larger R by C tables. McNamara's test is intended specifically for 2 by 2 tables, but there are closely related tests to McNamara's that generalize to larger two-way frequency tables. The general subject of frequency table analysis is extensive. In many situations, there are multiple tests that may be appropriate for a given frequency table. The choice of test will depend on the specific design and research question under study for that data. Choosing the optimal test for the situation at hand is important and can lead to smaller p-values. In some situations, there may be multiple appropriate tests for a given table, all of which are equivalent and will yield the same p-value. We will see examples of this latter case in our discussion of the chi-square test of homogeneity and McNamara's test, where there are multiple equivalent ways to calculate a p-value for the hypothesis of interest. Let's start with the chi-square test of homogeneity. Our case illustration comes from a randomized controlled trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine in January of 2011 that found that the use of antibiotics speeds recovery from ear infections in young children. In this randomized double-blind trial, children 6 to 35 months of age with acute otitis media diagnosed with the use of strict criteria received amoxicillin clavulinate or placebo for seven days. The primary outcome was the time to treatment failure from the first dose until the end of treatment visit on day eight. The definition of treatment failure was based on the overall condition of the child, including adverse events, and otoscopic signs of acute otitis media. Rather than focusing on the time to treatment failure, let's look at a related outcome that was also reported in the paper, whether or not treatment failure occurred within the seven-day window of treatment. This outcome is dichotomous and is summarized using the two-way frequency table shown here. The rows of the table display the counts associated with each intervention arm, while the columns of the table provide summary information separately about treatment failure and treatment success. The last row and last column in the table contain the marginal frequencies for the row or column in question. The final cell in the table in the lower right corner contains the overall count of evaluable subjects for the outcome. As you can see, there is a multitude of numbers that one can calculate to describe different aspects of this table. Of primary interest for treatment failure are the row percents describing the treatment failure rate in each intervention arm in the study. The failure rate in the amox clav group is 30 out of 161, equal to a proportion of 0.186, or 18.6%. The treatment failure rate in the placebo group is 71 out of 158, equal to a proportion of 0.449, or 44.9%. From a practical perspective, a difference in failure rate of approximately 26% would seem to be important. The chi-square test of homogeneity can be used to conduct a hypothesis test of the difference in these proportions to determine whether or not this difference is statistically significant. We can state the null hypothesis as follows. The proportion of treatment failures in the two groups is the same. Equivalently, we can say that the difference in proportions between the two groups is zero. The alternative hypothesis is that the proportion of treatment failures in the two groups is different, or equivalently, 
the difference in the proportions is non-zero. Let's perform the test at the standard significance level of 0 0.05. The p-value generated by the chi-score test of homogeneity in this example is less than 0 0.001. Since the p-value is less than or equal to 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that our result is statistically significant. From a statistical perspective, we conclude that there is evidence to indicate that the proportion of treatment failures in the two groups is different. There are a variety of effect measures that can be presented to help make a meaningful clinical interpretation of the results. One can report actual proportions, 0.449 or 44.9% experience treatment failure on placebo, but only 0.186 or 18.6% experience treatment failure on a MOX clav. Report the difference in proportions in the associated 95% confidence interval, or report the risk or odds ratio in associated 95% confidence interval. A few important comments about this test. The chi-square test of homogeneity is based on approximations that are generally accurate as long as the expected value in each cell of the table under the null hypothesis is greater than or equal to 5. We will demonstrate in the next segment a simple way to determine the expected cell count in a two-way frequency table. The test of homogeneity is a way of determining whether two subgroups of a population, say treatment and control, share the same distribution of a single categorical variable. As mentioned earlier, the test of homogeneity can handle more than two rows or two columns. You should select effect measures that make sense given the design and context of the data it is generally recommended that you report both an absolute measure of effect, such as the difference in proportions, in combination with a relative measure of effect, such as the relative risk or odds ratio. Keep in mind that it's always good to present associated confidence intervals with effect measures if possible. In the StatCrunch demo later in this module, we will demonstrate two equivalent approaches for conducting this test. Now let's talk about Fisher's exact test. Let's use another outcome from the Otitis Media trial to illustrate Fisher's exact test. An important consideration in interpreting the clinical implications of the difference in treatment failure rates is the incidence of side effects in the two treatment groups. Obviously, this is of particular importance in the treatment of young children. Let's focus our attention on complications of otitis media. The complications considered were perforation and mastoiditis. There was a single adverse event in the amox clav group and five in the placebo group. We can summarize this outcome in a simple 2x2 two two frequency table similar to that used for the treatment failure outcome. Of primary interest again are the row percents describing the complication rate in each intervention arm in the study. The complication rate in the amox clav group is 1 out of 161 equal to a proportion of 0 0.006 or 0 0.6 percent. The complication rate in the placebo group is 5 out of 158 equal to a proportion of 0 0.032 or 3.2 percent. The null and alternative hypotheses are identical in structure to those used for treatment failure. We can state the null hypothesis as follows. The proportion of subjects with complications in the two groups is the same. Equivalently, we can say that the difference in proportions between the two groups is zero. The alternative hypothesis says that the proportion of subjects with complications in the two groups is different, or equivalently, the difference in the proportions is non-zero. Let's perform the test at the standard significance level of 0 0.05. Can we use the chi-square test of homogeneity here?
What about the small observed cell sizes of 1 and 5 in this table? Recall that the assumption is not related to the observed cell count, but rather the expected cell count under the null hypothesis. If the expected cell count in any cell is less than 5, then the assumptions of the test are questionable. We will discuss how to calculate expected cell counts momentarily, but for now let's just display what they are. For the two complication cells in the table, the expected cell counts under the null, as you may have suspected, are both less than 5 and approximately equal to 3. What's the solution? We can use Fisher's exact test, which is an alternate test that doesn't have any requirements on expected cell counts. The mathematical details of this test are more complicated than those for the chi-square test of homogeneity, and we have no need to discuss those details. Suffice it to say that the calculation of the test statistic doesn't require any approximations based on expected cell frequencies. The p-value generated by Fisher's exact test in this example is equal to 0.12. Since the p-value is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that our result is not statistically significant. Note that the chi-square test of homogeneity p-value for this data is 0.09, only slightly different. We also note that the paper reports a p-value of 0.10, which I believe is simply due to how they rounded the p-value. From a statistical perspective, we conclude that there is insufficient evidence to indicate that the proportion of subjects with complications of otitis media in the two groups is different. There are a variety of effect measures that can be presented to help make a meaningful clinical interpretation of the results. One can report actual proportions, 0.032 or 3.2% experience complications on placebo, and 0.006 or 0.6% experience complications on a max clav. You could also report the difference in proportions or report the risk ratio or odds ratio depending on the design of the study. Note that there are some complicating issues regarding the use of confidence intervals for effect measures when using Fisher's exact test. Because of differences in the way that the Fisher's exact test p-value is calculated and the way that exact confidence intervals are generated is not the same, they can sometimes disagree, leading to difficulties in interpretation of results. Let me close with a few comments about using Fisher's exact test. Fisher's exact test can be used interchangeably with the chi-square test of homogeneity, but becomes computationally intensive for large sample sizes. Like the test of homogeneity, Fisher's exact test can handle more than two rows or two columns. Determining expected cell counts to evaluate whether or not a Fisher's exact test or test of homogeneity is appropriate can be easily calculated with a simple formula given on the next slide. Don't forget to make a clinical interpretation of the result. There are a variety of effect measures that can be used depending on the study design and question of interest, but remember that there are some complicating issues regarding agreement of confidence intervals and p-values. Let's illustrate the calculation for the expected cell count using the cell in the table corresponding to the counts of complications in the amox clav group, which has an observed count of 1. In order to determine the expected cell size, simply multiply the row total, 161, by the column total, 6, and then divide by the grand total, 319. This yields an expected cell count of approximately 3. This concludes the first segment of our discussion of two-way frequency tables. In the next segment, we will discuss McNamara's test for paired data.